Amen. Good morning. Hey, I want to thank everybody that came out yesterday for the work day and worked. We got a lot, lot done yesterday, and uh, I just want to thank you for, for donating your time and effort and tools and paint brushes and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We got a lot done, but I uh, just want to thank you all for that. Um, had a good turnout, got a lot of stuff done, and uh, we just appreciate that. Thank you for being willing to serve your church. Now, this morning... We are, uh, I didn't lie to you this week. Uh, Matt was like, hey, do you lie this week? Because a couple weeks ago, I was like, hey, we're going to start a new series. And then last week, I was like, yeah, so we're not starting a new series. I lied to you. So, so this week, um, I'm proud to say that I'm not standing on the platform as a liar this week, okay? We are starting a new series. And what we're going to do is we're going to take about six weeks and we're just going to kind of slide through the life story of Jacob, okay? So grab your Bible and get it open to Genesis chapter 25. And uh, the title of the new series is Jacob from Deceiver to Believer. And uh, like I said, my hope here for, for this series is that when we're done with it, we can see Jacob as a real person, okay? Because because I think y'all know my thoughts. A lot of us pick up the Bible and read the Bible or you go to church and you hear a preacher talk about someone in the Bible. And we tend to think that the people in the Bible are just characters, right? We tend to think that they're just these made up characters in some kind of story. And you know, we're all good church people. So we would never say that we don't really believe that they were real people, but there's just something in us that kind of tends to sway us toward like, well, these were these people even real? And so my goal for this is that after we get done studying the life of Jacob, we can say, man, I know all about Jacob. He was just a dude like I am. He, he was just a guy who had some struggles and he came to Jesus and he followed the Lord. And uh, so what we're gonna do is as we breeze through his life, we're gonna pick up on some principles and we're gonna be challenged on some things uh, about Jacob, okay? He was a real man with real struggles. Uh, he had real sin problems in his life. Uh, he had real decisions to make about God. He had real decisions to make about spiritual things. He's no different than we are, okay? And uh, so I wanna get familiar with Jacob and learn from his life. And that's really the, the purpose, because I know some of you are thinking, well, Kev, I mean, you're talking about Genesis. This is the Old Testament. Like, why do we need to be in the Old Testament? We don't do the sacrifices. We don't uh, go by the Old Testament ceremonial law. We don't go by the Old Testament laws to the Jewish people. Why do we need to study in the Old Testament? And I'm going to tell you the answer. I'm going to give you the same answer Paul gave in 1 Corinthians 10, 11. In regards to what happened with Paul's ancestors, Paul says, these things... This stuff we're talking about this morning, Jacob, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for who? Yeah, for us, on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So this is written down to reveal to us who God is and then as a warning, like, you know, Jacob was a pretty good guy at times, but he struggled, so it's written down for us so that we can take these principles from the life of Jacob and apply them to our life. So Genesis chapter 25 and uh, Genesis first book of the Bible. And let me start reading in verse 19. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read from verse 19 all the way through verse 40. If you don't have a Bible with you, we've got the uh, scripture up on the screen. Just follow along. I'm going to read, pray, and then we'll get into it. Okay. It says, this is the account of the family line of Abraham's son, Isaac. You're like, hold on, Kev, I thought we were talking about Jacob. Yeah, we'll get there. Just keep reading. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel the Aramean from, Pad from Padanaram, and the sister of Laban the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife, Rebekah, became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her, and she said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. 
Then the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb and two peoples from within you will be separated. One will be stronger than the other and the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of, open cunt, of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That's why he's also called Edom. Edom means red, red stew. Verse 31, Jacob replied, mm, first sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good's the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, this is your word. Um, we submit our minds and our hearts to it. And uh, we just pray that this morning, as we look at the beginning of the life of Jacob, that you'd speak to us, that your Holy Spirit would convict us, and uh, that you just make us more like Jesus in it, Lord. I pray that you give us ears to hear this morning, and I pray that you would speak. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, uh, really just two main points this morning. Um, starting back in verse 19, if you look at it, let's meet the family, okay? Let's meet the family. Uh, so if you've got your sermon notes there on the back of your bulletin, you'll see somewhat of a family tree, uh, but your pastor is pretty technologically challenged. So if you want to make fun of my family tree that I did, that's fine. I can take it. I know my strengths and weaknesses and technology is not one of them, but I think you all can at least get the point here. Okay. If you look at your family tree and then you look back at verse 19 in Genesis 25, it says, this is the account of the family line of Abraham's son, Isaac. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac ends up being uh, uh, a dad to two boys, Esau and Jacob. So from Jacob's perspective, because this series is about Jacob, Jacob's grandfather was Abraham, right? His dad was Isaac and his brother was Esau. Now, if you have any kind of familiarity with the Bible, you know that God called Abram or later changed his name to Abraham. He called him out of like modern day Iraq and uh, he called him and he promised Abraham that he was going to make a whole nation of people from his offspring, from his descendants. And so you've got grandpa Abraham, dad Isaac, and then of course you've got Jacob and his brother Esau, okay? Now I've got in your sermon notes just a few principles I want you to write down as we meet the family. We learn from verse 21 that Jacob's dad was a prayer. Jot that down. Jacob's dad, Isaac, was a prayer. P-R-A-Y-E-R. He prayed. See that in verse 21. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife. Why? Well, because she couldn't have kids. She was childless and couldn't have kids. And he prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife. Paul's. Pause for a second. Let me ask you something. Men, you doing this? You praying for your wife? I, I mean, I hope you are because that's the closest human relationship you have and will ever have on this side of heaven. We ought to be praying for our wives. You say, but, but, but no problem with us, Kev. We got kids. See, uh, Rebecca couldn't have kids. That's why Isaac was praying for her. O okay. Okay, God may have blessed you with children, but do you pray for other things for your wife? Do you pray about her spiritual condition? Are you praying, Lord, Lord, grow her. Lord, mature her in the faith. Lord, make her a mighty woman of prayer. Lord, make her a great role model to our kids. Are you praying for your wife's spiritual condition? Are you praying for her struggles? Like, you know what kind of struggle your wife has. Are you praying for her relationships? 
her coworker relationships, her friend relationships, her uh, family relationships. Are you praying for that? Are you praying for her health and her safety? We ought to be. We ought to be. And listen, that's in the context, we're talking about Isaac praying for Rebecca. So it would be right to say, men, are you praying for your wives? But really, that's not the scope of it all. How about wives, are you praying for your husbands? It's not just the husband praying for the wife thing. It's a two-way street. How are we doing with that? Well, Jacob's dad was a prayer. Jot this down from verse 21. The Lord answers prayer. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. Then look, the Lord answered his prayer and his wife, Rebecca, became pregnant. Now, uh, you might say to yourself, Kev, you know, it's pretty elementary you know, to say that the Lord answers prayer and make us write that down, like uh, we all kind of know that. Okay, we all know that, but do we believe that? And, we'll, and it's Sunday morning and we're all at church and everybody will be quick to go, yes, I believe it. Well, then my, my question then is, then why don't you pray more? I mean, deep down, if you really believe the Lord answers prayer, why don't you pray more? He answered Isaac's prayer. He prayed on behalf of Rebecca because she couldn't have kids. The Lord heard, the Lord answers. If he answered Isaac, Isaac is a man. He's just a, a person like we are. If he answered Isaac, he'll answer you. Sometimes it's yes, sometimes it's not yet. Sometimes it's, no, nah, I got something better for you than that. But he answered Isaac's prayer. It says, Rebecca became pregnant. You don't have to jot this down, but just kind of note it in your head. Conception and birth are decided by God, okay? All right, not the government, not, not, not popular opinion, not what society tells you. Conception and birth are decided by God. There are no accidents. There are no orphans in God's mind. Conception, birth, that's God's role. And really, that's why we believe abortion is a sin, okay? Because when you terminate a pregnancy or a fetus or whatever you may want to call it, a clump of cells, you are actually stepping into God's role, right? And we believe conception is from God. So the Lord answered Isaac's prayer. Rebecca became pregnant. Verse 22 tells us the babies jostled each other within her. And the Hebrew there, the original Hebrew word for jostled means that, that they crushed each other. They smashed each other. They were like little brothers, right? You know, like when Eric was younger, you know, I just put him in a clothes basket and roll him down the steps or what. You all know, know how brothers do, right? Well, well, apparently this started in her womb. They jostled, they, they wrestled one another. So we see that Jacob's dad was a prayer and that the Lord answers prayers. Jot this down about Jacob's mom. She was a prayer. Verse 22 says, the babies jostled one another within her and she said, why is this happening to me? Here's the key. So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord. She didn't really know what was going on in her life. She was like, what's, kind of, what's going on with this pregnancy? Did y'all know 4,000 years ago they didn't have ultrasounds, right? So, so, so like it was the mom's intuition and plus kind of picking up the uh, clue phone from her body. Something was going on here. And notice when she was worried about what was going on in times of difficulty, she sought the Lord. So should we. She, she didn't go to her friends and go, well, what do you think's going on here with this pregnancy? She didn't go to Isaac or her family. She didn't go to the internet blogs. She didn't go to a fortune teller. She went to the Lord. Something's going on. I need to know. I know the one who has the answers. And, and so like for you, do, what about when something's going on in your life? When something's happening in your life, are you quick to Google it? Are you quick to go to your friends and try to get their diagnosis or are you going to the Lord? What's going on with this, Lord? What's your will in this? What are you trying to teach me? How are you trying to grow me? That's what we should be doing. That's what Rebecca did because she was a prayer. And then jot this down. We see from verse 23, the Lord speaks. 
So she prayed, she went to the Lord and inquired, like, what's going on? Verse 23 says, the Lord said to her, so he speaks. He speaks and he tells her, there are two nations in your womb. Now at first glance, you can be like, what? There are two peoples from within you that will be separated. In other words, you've got two babies in there and, and, and there's going to be two different people groups or two different nationalities come from these two different babies. One will be the father of one people group or nationality. The other will be a father of another nationality or people group. One will be stronger than the other. The older will serve the younger, God tells her when she's trying to figure out what's going on. I just want you to note this. You know, we said the Lord speaks. He spoke to Rebecca. He will speak to you. Okay. Now, not audibly, I've never heard God say, go to Taco Bell for lunch, Kevin, okay? I've never heard God speak audibly to me. Sorry, that was just the best I could come up with in this moment. So, so but, but we know we live in a different time period, right? You know, 4,000 years ago, um, Rebecca didn't have the Bible, right? She didn't have the Holy Spirit living within her. And so God spoke audibly. Now God will speak to you, but not audibly. He'll speak to you through his word, right? This is God's word. This is what he has to say to you. He will speak through his word. He will speak through his Holy Spirit in your life, and he will speak through other people, okay? So Jacob's dad was a prayer. We saw the Lord answer his prayers. Jacob's mom was a prayer, See that the Lord speaks. Jot this down from verse 24. It says, when the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. Just note this, God's timing's perfect. God's timing is perfect. And so in Genesis 15, uh, verses one through six, you'll see it here on the screen. Um, the Lord is speaking to Abraham or Abram. He says, don't be afraid, Abram. I'm your shield, your very great reward. Look what Abraham says. He says, sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? The Lord's like, I'm so good to you. And Abraham's like, yeah, but, but I mean, you know, I don't even have kids, Lord. Verse three, Abraham said, uh, you've given me no children, so a servant in my household, Eliezer, will be my heir. He'll get my inheritance. Then look what the Lord said. The word of the Lord came to him and said, this man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. This was a promise to Abraham from God. Verse five said, he took him outside and said, look up at the sky. Count the stars if you can count them. Then he says to Abram, so shall your offspring be. Abraham believed the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness. Listen, this is grandpa Abraham and God's made him a promise that, hey, you're gonna have so many descendants, you're gonna have more descendants than there are stars in the sky. And, and question, when Abraham had his son Isaac, you think he passed that promise along to Isaac? Of course, you know Abraham had to say, son, we had no kids. We didn't think we were going to have kids. And then the Lord said, you're going to have all these descendants. And now look, son, I've got you. I've got Isaac. And, and so Isaac knew this promise made by God to his father. Now Isaac's praying for his wife, Rebecca, and he's thinking, well, how's my dad going to have all these descendants if we don't have kids? And so he prays for his wife, Rebecca. And I want you to notice the timeline. Look down in verse 20. Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah. Now look over in verse 26. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to the kids. They waited 20 years for kids. 20 years for how many times do you think Isaac prayed for Rebecca over 20 years of her not being able to have kids so what what is it that you're waiting on maybe you're waiting on kids maybe you're waiting on a spouse uh, maybe you're waiting on a job maybe you're waiting on the salvation of a loved one listen wait faithfully don't write it off don't give up keep praying 
Isaac prayed for Rebecca for 20 years. Don't put it off. You say, but, but Kev, Kev, the, the thing I've been praying for, like, why is it taking so long? Well, 2 Peter 3, 8 says, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day, okay? So it, it's taken a long time from your perspective, not so long from the Lord's perspective. You say, but I just don't understand why, why I have to wait on what I'm praying for. Well, that's okay. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, the Lord says, my thoughts aren't your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than yours. You don't always have to understand. We just need to echo David in Psalm 31, 15 when he said this, my times are in your hands. I don't know what it is you're waiting for. I don't know what it is you've been praying for for months or years or decades, but, but stay at it. Be persistent. Isaac was, the Lord heard, and in his timing, he delivered. His timing's perfect. Now, we've met uh, dad and mom at this time, Isaac and Rebecca, because we're still meeting the family, and uh, so now I need some participation. Come on, Sam. Come on, Chris Wallace. Come on. All y'all have to do is stand up here and look pretty. <laughs> They're laughing at you. No, come on up here. Come on up here. I should not even let you up here with that Florida State shirt on, but I love you anyways. Come on up here, Chris Wallace. You just got to look pretty, buddy. All right. So, so, so I want you to think about this. This is just a visual aid for this morning, okay? Let's talk about um, Jacob's brother first from verse 25. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment, so they named him Esau. <laughs> what are y'all laughing at? So, 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 guess who's Esau? Yeah, yeah, so Esau was red yeah. and, and hairy, mm -hmm. right? Take your shirt off, show them how hairy you are. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Boy, you get me and Sam together, it'll go off the rails quick, all right, all right? So Esau comes out, he's red, he's hairy, right? This is Jacob's good looking, Sam says. This is a Chewbacca baby is who, who he is. And so, so if you look in verse 27, speaking of Esau, so the boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter a man of the open country. So when you think about Esau, I, I want you to think about, uh, just write this down. Jacob's brother was an outdoorsman, all right? Esau, rough, red, man's man, hunter, hairy, good looking, right? That's right. His nickname was Edom. Remember, we saw that earlier. Edom means red, right? Because he liked red stew. He was kind of reddish, fired up. Now that's Jacob's brother Esau. Uh, jot this down from verse 26. Uh, Jacob was a con artist. Okay. Verse 26 says, after this, after Esau came out, his brother came out. So now we're talking about Jacob. Now notice his hand was grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. So you'd be like, well, why'd they name him Jacob just because he was grabbing at his older brother's heel as he was being uh, delivered? Well, here's what you got to know. Jacob means he grasps at the heel. And really what it means is he's a deceiver. It, it's a Hebrew idiom for someone who always messes over somebody. He deceives people. Th that was Jacob's character. And we're going to sit now. I'm not suggesting... This is a, listen, and this is a police officer, you know, I'm not, I'm not suggesting this is his character. We'll get to Chris in just a second, but, but Jacob was, he messed people over. And as we go through this series, we're going to see how he messes people over and how he's going to be living up to his name, Jacob, the deceiver, the con artist. So, so listen now, if we think of Esau as Sam, so Esam, that's what we're going to start calling him, right? Hairy, right. red, manly man. All right, well, what about Jacob? Just write this down in your sermon notes. We get this from verse 27. Jacob was a mama's boy. <laughs> verse 27 says, Esau became a skillful, hun skillful hunter, 
a man of the open country while Jacob was content to stay at home among the, Jacob's like, yeah, I don't go outside much. Uh, I like to, I'm a homebody. Um, I don't spend much time outside. I don't want to mess up my nails. Um, we would say that maybe Jacob was metrosexual, right? That's what we may say today. Um, he's a pretty boy. So when you think of Jacob, think, you know, GQ model, you know, so... So if Esau is like hairy and burly and outdoorsman and manly man, you know, think of Jacob visually as smooth, clean cut, GQ. And you say, well, well, how do you know that Jacob was smooth and, and clean cut? Well, I'll jump ahead in the story and just read from Genesis 27, 11. Jacob himself speaking to his mom. And he says, my brother Esau is a hairy man while I have smooth skin. So baby face, GQ, model. All right, y'all are done. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Love you, Chris. He didn't even want to give me a hug. He didn't, he didn't, <laughs> didn't even want to give me a hug. Think about that. So, so now we're on it, okay? We're talking about Jacob, and, and he's a con artist. He's a deceiver. He, he's a, he's a, a good-looking, GQ, smooth-skinned mama's boy who likes to cook. He probably liked to sew. He probably took a lot of Epsom salt baths. He, he, Jacob was just that kind of dude, all right? Now, now, so now we've met the family. We've got dad, Isaac, mom, Rebecca. We've got brother, Esau, and we've seen Jacob. Now, I want to show you something here in verse 28, and then we'll move on. Isaac and Rebecca were both prayers. We wrote that down a second ago, but they weren't perfect. Okay, verse 28 tells us, Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, so dad loved beef jerky, fresh catch, a good steak on the grill. He had a taste for wild game. He loved Esau. So Esau was daddy's boy, right? Jacob loved, or excuse me, Isaac loved Esau. But Rebecca, mom, loved Jacob. She loved Jacob. Listen, they were prayers, but they weren't perfect. See, they played favorites. And this causes dysfunction in a family, okay? And, and if you have any kind of idea of the background uh, of, of Genesis, you'll know that this was a generational struggle. This was a problem in this family. If you remember correctly, Grandpa Abraham, not only did he have Isaac as a son, but tell me he had another son, Ishmael. And Abraham kind of played favorites, didn't he? Grandpa Abraham's favorite son was Isaac. Now we're seeing that Isaac's favorite son is Esau and Rebekah's favorite son is Jacob. And if you know anything about Jacob, Jacob had 12 sons. And did Jacob have a favorite son? Yeah, his name was Joseph. We talked about him four or five weeks ago. Remember? Joseph was such daddy's boy. Daddy made him the special coat. And Joseph's like, I'm daddy's boy. And his brothers wanted to kill him, right? So this was a generational struggle from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob. They all struggled with favoritism. And listen, if you want a surefire way to produce conflict and heartache in your family, just pick favorites. Just pick favorites, okay? This is also a good, a good way for us to stop and say, look, man, Isaac and Rebekah were prayers. They followed the Lord, but they weren't perfect, right? They had their struggles, kind of like us. We follow the Lord. We're not perfect. All right, so we've met the family now. Now let's see Jacob begin to live up to his name from verse 29. Jot this down in your sermon notes. Jacob cons his brother, right? He is a con artist. He's a deceiver. He grasps at the heel. Well, he, he cons his brother. If you start in verse 29 and look, it says, once when Jacob was cooking some stew, so mama's boy is at home among the tents cooking, right? Doing what he does. Notice Esau comes in from the open country and he is tired and hungry. And uh, man, I've got a good friend of mine. I'm telling you at 1130 or 1145 every morning, if you ain't talking about lunch, he just gets so hangry. And I mean, you can't even hardly talk to him. You got to figure out about lunch. And, and I just can't help but to think, this is Esau. He busts in the door. He's been out doing what the outdoorsman does. He's 
hunting, running around, and he busts in the door, and, uh, you know, pretty boy Jacob is there cooking. Look what he says. He says, like, quick, give me some of that red stew. I'm famished. I'm starving. I'm starving. And then look, here's the first evidence of Jacob being a con man. He makes Esau an offer, okay? And by the way, it's a terrible offer. Like if you play fantasy football here, we got a couple fantasy football leagues here and like 20 dudes play it. If you're in Sam's league, he will offer you a trade that's terrible. Just don't take, it'll be like, I get Patrick Mahomes and Christian McCaffrey and you get the Titans defense, okay? He'll just give you this awful, awful offer. But as bad as Sam is, doesn't hold a candle to Jacob because Jacob makes this terrible offer to his brother and he says, oh, you're hungry? Hmm, okay. Well, um, first, sell me your birthright. You want some of this stew? Okay, sell me your birthright. And you're thinking, so what's the big deal with the birthright? Well, just understand this. The birthright was like this package deal that included a double portion of dad's inheritance. Okay, so if you were the oldest son, you had the birthright. And as soon as dad and mom died, you got two thirds of their inheritance and little brother would only get one third. All right, now I'm the oldest and I like that. So if mom and dad could make a note of that, uh, that would be great for me. But, but this is how it was 4,000 years ago. It's called the birthright. And the oldest son got two thirds of the inheritance. And then not only that, he also had the right to be the family leader when mom and dad died, okay? This was the birthright, two-thirds of the inheritance and the right to be the family leader. Now, the birthright could be sold or it could be given away, but if it was given away or sold, the firstborn lost those privileges, okay? He then only got one-third of the inheritance and he was not the future family leader. So think about this. I'm starving, give me a bowl of soup. And the con man's like, I've been waiting for this. Some of your birthright. Now, let's just kind of weigh these out. The birthright, two-thirds of everything mom and dad has, and the right to be the family leader versus lentil soup. I mean, at least it could have been like a, you know, a double teriyaki chicken plate from Panda Express and a gallon of Mayfield Southern Butter Pecan Ice Cream. It would have made a little bit more sense if it was something, but really lentil soup? Sell me your birthright and I'll give you some of this soup. And just how long had Jacob been scheming on that birthright? I mean, we don't know, but that's just a question I have in my mind. And Esau didn't help because he's pretty dramatic. You know, I mean, look what Esau says. He says in verse 32, I'm about to die. Like, really? Really, you've been out hunting and you come in and you're literally about to starve to death? I think he's just being a little dramatic here. But the con man capitalizes on Esau's weakness. And he says here in verse 33, swear to me first. Swear to me. And, and he turns the pressure up on Esau. And can't you see? I mean, this is brothers, right? Can't you see Jacob? And he's probably got that stew in a bowl and he's probably, mm, mm, this smells so good, wafting it over toward Esau. And he's like, sell me your birthright. I'm about to die, man. Okay, swear to me that I can have your birthright. And then sadly, says he sold him his birthright. Jacob gave him some bread and a lentil stew. And uh, he ate and drank and got up and left and despised his so what I want to look at now is, uh, just for a second, jot this down. Esau's problem was impulsiveness. Right? He just came in, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, give me some of that soup. Well, sell me your birthright. And, and see, Esau had no concern with mo what mattered most. I mean, for real, what matters more? A bowl of soup or your birthright. But see, impulsive people, they just don't really have a concern with what matters most. Esau ate, drank, got up, kept it moving, no big deal, gave his birthright away. See, he didn't care about the future. 
He's all about the desires of right now. That's impulsive people. I'm hungry. Well, give me your birthright. He should have said, well, hold on. I'm going to give you my whole future. But he didn't care about the future. He was too concerned with what could make him feel good right now and for a moment. He was so focused on satisfying that hunger that he forfeited his future blessing. And he didn't even consider the consequences of his decision. I mean, think about it. What if Esau could have seen the things that his descendants would have been part of? I mean, what if he took a second and thought about the future? You think he would have valued his birthright more? I mean, we could have been saying the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau, but we don't say that. It's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because Esau didn't have any regard for the future. These things were too far in the future for him to see. He had this live-in-the-moment mentality, and it was all about instant gratification, right? I don't care what i got to give up. i just got this desire within me, and I'm, I'll do whatever because... Boy, we live in an instant gratification society, don't we? And the immediate pleasures often lose sight of future blessing. And so the immediate desire for sex as a single often forfeits the blessing of, of staying pure until you're married, right? Because in that moment, there's so much pressure and desire, and I'll just give it away. I don't care about the future. And, and not just sex. I mean, we can get real practical. What about, what about eating? Some of us suffer from diabetes and high blood pressure and things. And in the moment, I want that. I don't care about the future. I don't care about how it's going to affect my health in a negative way. How many of us are like this when we go buy stuff that we want but we can't afford, so we put it on a credit card? And, and, and getting stuff now, that instant gratification, and, and I lose sight of the future financial strain because of my decisions, but I don't even care because I want it right now. And, and the pressure of the moment distorted Esau's perspective and it made the situation seem urgent. That's why he's like, I'm about to die. Like, you're not about to die, dude. You're just hungry. But the hunger pain made it seem dis- like dire to him. And it's the same for us. Because sometimes during a time of financial pressure, it's easy to have your perspective distorted and give in to a bit of dishonesty. Or, or, or in a time of pressure, the vow you made to your spouse may seem unimportant in that time of sexual desire. See, Esau's problem was impulsiveness. And that's really all I want to say about Esau because the series is about Jacob. So now I want to focus in on Jacob for just a minute before we're done. If Esau's problem was impulsiveness, write this down. Jacob's problem is self-centeredness. I just tend to believe that if Jacob lived in 2020 and he went to see a psychiatrist, I believe Jacob would walk out the door with the diagnosis of being a narcissist. Okay? A narcissist is just somebody who's so self-absorbed and they think they're more important than they are and everything in their world revolves around them and they think everything in everybody's world should revolve around them. That's a narcissist. And I believe Jacob was a narcissist. His problem was that he was self-centered. Now jot these notes down. Now remember, we're taking notes about Esau and Jacob here and Esau's impulsiveness and Jacob's self-centeredness and that's all good to, to make kind of a character profile of them but, but really why are we studying this? What did Paul say? These things were written down for us. So the idea is not for us to give some kind of comprehensive profile uh, and, and psychiatric evaluation to Jacob. The, the idea is to see it in Jacob and then say, do I do this? Am I like this? So jot jot this down. Number one, self-centered people have a me-first attitude. Self-centered people have a me-first attitude. That was shown at their birth. I mean, y'all remember what happened, right? Esau came out and Jacob was doing what? He was grabbing at Esau's heel because he wanted out first. And then fast forward to the story about the birthright. Listen, Jacob didn't care that Esau was hungry. He wanted the birthright, and what he wanted was more important. 
because self-centered people have a me-first attitude. Also, you can write this down, self-centered people will take advantage of anybody. Anybody, it doesn't matter. There, there's no person that a, that a narcissist won't take advantage of. I mean, think about it. This is his brother that he's conning out of his birthright. This is not some stranger that he didn't know, and that wouldn't make it right in and of itself either, but this is his brother. Self-centered people take advantage of anybody because they're always looking out for number one because they have a me-first attitude. Write this down. Self-centered people aren't interested in other people's lives. You say, well, what do you mean by that, Kev? Well, I mean, think about it. When Esau busts in the door, Jacob didn't ask Esau about anything. Jacob didn't say, hey, bro, what's going on, man? Did you catch anything today? Did you run into any problems while you're outside? You, you know, when you're in the woods running around, what, I mean, did you enjoy yourself while you, you were out there? And when Esau said, I'm starving, Jacob didn't go, well, dang, man, when was the last time you ate? You know why Jacob didn't ask any of these questions to Esau? Because he wasn't really interested in Esau's life. It's all about me. All about me. And, and <laughs> well, we'll get to this. Jot this down. Self-centered people view others only as a means to an end. Self-centered people look at everybody they're around and they don't look at them as a person. They look at them as what can I get from them? It's always some kind of transactional mode. What can I get from you? What can I get from you? What can I get from you? Because other people are just a means to their end. He didn't care about his brother. He just viewed Esau as this tool to get the birthright. And sadly, self-centered people don't have any real relationships because they're not interested. There's no uh, reciprocation because they don't really care about anybody. They just want to know what I can suck from them. What can I get from them? What can I suck out of them? How can this advantage, how can this person give me an advantage or give me this? Self-centered people always want to be the focus. I mean, think about this. When Esau came in the door and made his request, he said, I'm starving. What did Jacob do? He took Esau's request and he twisted it and made, him, made it about himself, didn't he? Oh, you're starving. Well, uh, I'll give you some of this if you give me your birthright. He, he just twisted it. And, and self-centered people do this. It, it, you'll have a conversation with a self-centered person or if you are a self-centered person, you'll be in a conversation and what you'll find out is if the conversation's not about you, somehow you always turn it to be about you. And somebody comes to you and they're like, man, I'm telling you, I just, man, I almost got in a wreck on the way here this morning and I was just so terrified. Self-centered person goes, yeah, that happened to me one time. I was over on I-40 and this guy cut me off. And it's like, whoa, whoa. I thought this story was about the other person. But see, self-centered people always want to be the focus. They want to be the center of attention. And if they're not, they'll either walk away from what's going on or they'll turn it to be about them. So self-centered people have a me first attitude, will take advantage of anybody, aren't interested in other people's lives, view others only as a means to an end, always wanna be the focus, then jot this down. Self-centered people are calculated and manipulative. Self-centered narcissistic people are always always scheming their minds are always on go because they're always scheming and plotting how can I get this how can I use you to do this and they're manipulative and controlling they like to take people and control them to be the means to their personal end and they like to manipulate people they play with people's feelings and they play with people's desires that's exactly what Jacob did with Esau he manipulated Esau. He used his hunger against him to get what he wanted out of it because he's self-centered. Next, self-centered people are not generous. They're just not generous. They won't give anything to anybody else because they may need it for themselves in the future. 
even if what they have, even if their resources go wasted, that's fine. They'll just let them go wasted rather than giving them to somebody else because I might need them in the future. So if you're struggling with your KUB bill, don't ask that narcissist that you know because they're not going to give you anything because I may need it later. What if my air conditioner goes out? I can't give you money that I have. I mean, for real, think about it. His brother came in and said, I'm hungry. Surely you would think Jacob could have just been like, here, let me get you a bowl of soup, right? I mean, surely there was enough to share. I mean, who makes one bowl of soup? But see, self-centered people aren't generous. Even if he had to pour the rest of the soup out, he didn't give it to Esau because that could be a tool used to get what he wanted. And that's how selfish people are. Selfish people have little to no compassion. Little to no compassion. He didn't feel sorry for Esau. Uh, when Esau came in talking about how hungry he was, he didn't try to empathize with Hey man, I've been that hungry before. Sit down here, put your feet up. Let me get you something to eat. There's no compassion or little or no compassion. And if these people do show compassion, if they show compassion, it's usually a false compassion and they're only showing it because they're constantly calculating and manipulating people. See what I'm saying? Two more. Self-centered people are controlling. Jacob wanted control of the situation. He wanted control of the family. That was part of getting the birthright, right? You had the leadership position in the, uh, after your parents passed away. And, and selfish people are very controlling and they're driven by the fear of losing control. That's why they're always manipulating and calculating and looking to see what they can use people for. Lastly, self-centered people have no problem abandoning someone in order to get what they want. Self-centered people have no problem just cutting somebody off and abandoning them, abandoning them in order to get what they want. I mean, think about this. Jacob was perfectly fine cutting off a relationship with his brother. This is his blood brother, and he's like, eh, I'd rather have the birthright. I can do without this guy because it's all about power. It's all about control because self-centered people aren't really about people. They're about themselves and they have no problem abandoning someone in order to get what they want. Now remember, this series is on Jacob and we've seen he's a con artist. He's a deceiver. He messes people over. This is just one of a few we're going to see as we study. He's messed his brother over for the first time. We'll see him do it again next time. Now, what I don't want you to do is pack your stuff up and leave here and go, all right, I know a little bit about Jacob now. Cool story, Kev. We've got to go back to 1 Corinthians 10, 11. The reason this was written down was to warn us. Yes, we see Jacob was self-centered. Yes, we see Esau was impulsive. The question is, am I? Here's your sum up. Jacob was a self-centered deceiver that messed over his brother. How self-centered are you? We all struggle with it. Ask the Lord to deal with your heart and transform you from being self-centered to Christ-centered. Here's the challenge. Here's the question. Are you like Jacob? Are you selfish rather than selfless? Are you self-centered rather than Christ-centered? Are you more about self-glorification rather than bringing God glory? Do you exalt yourself rather than exalting Jesus? A and listen, listen to me. This is what we've all got to come to, the grips, to grips with. We're all like Jacob. To varying degrees... But we're all like Jacob, and I'm going to give you, a, I, I'm just going to tell you what I think. I think the most self-centered people here this morning or watching on YouTube or listening to the pod point, I think the most self-centered people here are going, I'm not selfish. Move on, Kev. I'm ready for lunch. Do your little prayer. Sing our last song. Let's get out of here. See, people, as we grow more and more like Jesus, we tend to go, Lord, search me. Search me and show me, Lord. Show me my self-centeredness. We're all self-centered to different degrees. 
I mean, if you see yourself in some of this, just know that you're not alone. We're all like this. Here's the key. As Christians, we need to confess this self-centeredness as sin, and then we need to ask God to change our hearts. Okay, because listen, here's the key. This is the frustration in the Christian life. Too many of us try to change by trying really hard. And you won't change your self-centeredness by trying really hard. Sure, you may walk out of here today and you may open the door and let someone go before you and you'll feel really good about yourself for about 15 seconds. But I'm talking about a true lasting heart change. You can't do that. You can't do that on your own. That change only comes through the Holy Spirit in you. So as Christians, we have to confess self-centeredness as sin. And we have to say, Lord, would you forgive me of that and change me? And would you fill me with your Holy Spirit? And then we have to walk in the Spirit. We have to walk in obedience to the Word of God and to the Holy Spirit that lives within us. That's the only way we're going to see some freedom from self-centeredness. If not, you're just going to be trapped in this. It's going to be a stronghold. Satan's got a foothold there. That's the challenge for Christians. But some of us listening this morning are like Esau. Some of us here, within an earshot of what I'm saying, have no concern with what matters most. And I'm here to tell you what matters most is spiritual things. What matters most is eternity. But some of us here have no concern with what matters most. You like how you're living. You love your sin. Eternity's too far in the future for you to even try to think about and you have that live in the moment attitude and you have that uh, instant gratification attitude going on and, and you think, well, I'll get right with God later in life when I get a little bit older. Listen, you sound like Esau. See, what you don't realize is the birthright God's offering you you don't even realize what God's offering you because you don't care about spiritual things. You love your sin. You're all about what feels good and, and what, what tries to bring satisfaction to your desires and your pleasures. And you don't even realize what God's offering you. Listen, Mark eight thirty six. Jesus says, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world? Like, what if you went out and slept with everybody you wanted to sleep with? What if you went out and got every cool car that you could get and get the biggest house in the world? What if you got all this stuff and power and fame and success? What good is all that to gain the world and forfeit your soul? It's kind of like forfeiting your birthright for a bowl of soup. The writer in Hebrews 12 says, don't be like Esau. Look, he says, anybody who's godless like Esau, I mean, for a single meal sold his inheritance and his rights as the oldest son. Afterwards, listen, after he gave that away, he wanted to inherit the blessing, but he was rejected. Why? Because he had already given it away. Even though he sought the blessing, with he cried over, I want it back, I don't want it. Look, he couldn't change what had been done. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, when your physical life ends on this earth, you can cry like Esau. You can try to get your birthright that God's offering you now. But what's done is done at that point. Don't trade away your spiritual birthright that God's offering you for a bowl of soup. He's offering you the forgiveness of your sin. The question is, will you trust in Christ and give him your life? Will you recognize your need for forgiveness? Will you recognize that you are a sinner and you can't make things right with God? You can't go to church enough. You can't, if you stop cussing, that don't make you right with God. The only thing that makes you right with God is faith in his son whom came and died for your sin on the cross and rose again on the third day. If you'll trust in that and give him your life, you can receive the forgiveness of your sin and you'll spend eternity in heaven. Don't give away your spiritual birthright for a bowl of soup, okay? I'm going to pray. We're going to sing one more praise song. The steps will be open. If you need prayer, uh, I'll be around. If you've got some questions, I'll be sitting right over here. Uh, if you'd like for someone to pray for you, we'd love to pray for you. Feel free to come up. If not, you want to just praise with us, uh, we encourage you to do that. Let's pray. 
Lord, thank you for your word. And Lord, it's easy to look at Jacob and even to look at Esau here and say, well, Esau's impulsive and and Jacob's self-centered. It's so easy for us to point the finger at other people, Lord, without ever examining ourselves. And God, this morning's not story time for adults. Lord, it's not just so we can come here and, and laugh a little bit and have fun and learn a little bit about Jacob and get familiar with him. Lord, the point of this morning is that we can see Jacob's weakness, his self-centeredness, and then let that reflect on our hearts and say, am I self-centered like this? We see Esau's impulsiveness and say, am I impulsive? Am I not caring about what matters most? Am I not focused on the future? God, I just pray that you would use these principles from the lives of two men, two brothers, and that you convict us with it today, Lord. 4,000 years later, I pray that it would convict our hearts today because of our impulsiveness and because of our self-centeredness, Lord. We confess that that's sin. And Lord, we want you to change our hearts. We want to be more like Jesus. We want to be selfless, Lord. We want to be Christ-centered and Christ-focused. So just change our hearts. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord, and help us walk in your love and in your spirit, Father. For anyone here who doesn't know you, who's never trusted in Christ for the forgiveness of their sins, I pray that you begin to work in their heart right now, Father. And I pray that they be saved. God, I pray that as we wrap up this morning that you're glorified and uh, that this is acceptable to you. I pray it in Jesus' name, amen.